Chapter Five of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Five: Waiho River, the High Country, Trek Cutting, Dry Camp Number Five, Wekas, Another Failure, Mapurika, Mount Moltke Spur, Camp Six, Camp Seven, Gale and Shipwreck, Return, Callery River heavy flood marching orders on douglas's return we began to blaze our track to the grass line behind camp two this very trying business is so constantly necessary that i must try and convey some idea of the work the undergrowth in the bush is as a rule so bad that progress is very slow even without a load on one's back but when carrying anything it is almost impossible to make any way at all it is therefore a saving of time to take a billhook and blaze or cut a narrow track before attempting to carry any load through the undergrowth when climbing a hill to reach the grass line this is more necessary than when travelling on flat country and an ascent of fifteen hundred feet is a good day's work often in the ranges the bush is fairly open from fifteen hundred feet to two and a half thousand feet above sea level consisting of large trees and little undergrowth but at the latter altitude mountain vegetation begins to appear amongst the trees and at three thousand feet the true impenetrable mountain scrub has to be faced this varies from ten to three feet in height and its denseness can hardly be appreciated by those who have not experienced it i have seen it thick enough to walk and crawl on top of and in nearly every locality a five thousand foot ascent is a good day's work sometimes it is literally too tangled to force a way through without a billhook to clear a track even when carrying no load and any attempt would leave very few garments on the back of the man who tried the only stuff i know which is impervious to the stiff pointed ends of the stunted vegetation is quote, gabardine end quote, made by t burberry and son basingstoke england the track which had to be cut from camp two to the grass line was my first experience of this sort of work and i can safely recommend it to anyone wishing to test his vocabulary five hours hard work only took me six hundred feet up the hill and now after considerable experience in blazing i have decided that a distance which takes an hour to cut will only take four or five minutes to go with a load on one's shoulders after it is cleared we only clear a width of about two feet sufficient to get our loads along in comfort owing to the wet weather and various other delays it was twenty third of december before we had our camp pitched in the last piece of mountain scrub some four thousand feet above sea level on the opposite side of the glacier to cape defiance and the unserfritz fall we named this dry camp or number five because there was only one small drip of water from an overhanging rock which took some hours to fill the billy a thousand feet above the camp there was a small peak from which the finest panorama in the district without going above the snow line can be obtained looking south from here was the great neve basin of the franz joseph glacier with its tributary ice falls the agassiz melchior etc and beyond them were the fine rock peaks of the dividing range including mount spencer nine thousand one hundred and fifty seven feet jervois eight thousand six hundred and seventy five feet and another nine thousand five hundred and eleven feet which i named conway's peak lying on the divide at the point from which the bismarck range branches to the north across the valley this range with its peaks glaciers and waterfalls was seen for the whole of its length and to the north the coastline could be followed bluff after bluff to the wanganui river and still further we could see the paparoa ranges north of greymouth between ninety and one hundred miles away when douglas had rejoined me on the sixteenth december we brought up some ten days stores only thinking that would be ample for our projected expedition to the neve however the rain and douglas's illness had kept us back so we were compelled to economize our food on christmas day we were in fog and could do nothing so we reluctantly decided to kill one of the pair of wekas which had honored us with their presence as they had two young ones we were unwilling to kill either of the birds but a christmas dinner looking very doubtful we shot the male previously i had shot a crow and on opening the weka's crop we had evidence of their extraordinary ideas of food for in it was the copper cartridge case which had been used for the crow already partly polished by the stones 
Mrs. Weka seemed to take a great interest in our method of preparing her late husband for the stew, and on my throwing the remains aside, her reason was obvious. She at once seized the discarded parts and carried them in triumph to her young ones, no doubt saying, Here, my dears, is part of your poor old father for a Christmas dinner. She then returned, carefully picked up, and gave her promising young family all the remains of the stew. In the West Coast ranges, it is the exception if hilltops are clear of fog after noon in the summer, and generally the clouds form on them as early as nine or ten a.m. Consequently, though the weather is fine in the valleys, we are often unable to do any work on the tops, except in the very early morning. For three days fog prevented our taking observations at or near dry camp. Until we had done this, it was useless to go on to the neve. The delay necessitated further supplies, and was the more inconvenient because our drip of water had ceased. On the 27th, Douglas went to camp too for some flour, and I took the two billies down to a creek, six thousand feet below, for water, and shot a bird or two. The 29th saw us with light loads of thirty pounds, pushing along the rotten rocky spur toward the neve of the Elmer Glacier, but again we were doomed to disappointment. At noon we came to a deep gorge, walled by rotten cliffs, down which stones were constantly falling. After an hour's work we managed to find a fair route into the gorge, but the other side was too rotten to ascend. There is no doubt a party of three could traverse this side without much trouble, but we did not consider it safe for two men to put so much dangerous ground behind them if any other route existed, because should any accident occur to one, I doubt if the other could have got out alone. Also, Douglas had been shaken by his recent attack of influenza, and was not fit to do such a difficult and long day as we should have before us. Wherever the schist formation ends and the slate begins, we find terribly shattered rocks, and when this occurs in a precipitous locality, it is often quite impossible to traverse the steep faces with real safety. The gorge that turned us back was near the point of junction of the two formations, and had enormous masses of rotten rock ready to fall. In fact, we could hardly touch any projecting stone, however large, without dislodging it. Having christened the gorge No-Go Creek, we returned to dry camp and, gathering all our goods, left them at 5 p.m. for Camp 2, which we reached at 8 p.m. On the last day of the year we moved to Camp 2, down to our old terminal face quarters, and found that the ice behind the Sentinel had so changed that it gave us great trouble to find a route off the glacier at all. During the next three weeks we had some very bad weather and floods, which considerably delayed my work on Lake Maporica, which I had been sent to survey before we did any further work at the glacier. This and other lakes on the low country lie between high moraine hills left by ancient glaciers. They are all supposed by the inhabitants to be bottomless. I do not know why, except that people seem to look upon a bottomless lake as a luxury, and are very angry with the man who destroys the illusion. The general rule is that they are not quite so deep as their height above sea level. Maporica lies about 275 or 300 feet above the sea, so I offered to bet that the lake was under 300 feet in depth, but no one would accept, for they said they knew the lake was bottomless. When I sounded in 14 places and found bottom always within 280 feet, many of the inhabitants of the district took it as a personal insult and have never quite forgiven me. While camping on the shore of the lake, I heard the cry of the rua, or large brown kiwi, now nearly extinct and very valuable. I believe there are one or two pairs in this locality. Thanks to a flood putting one of my camps four feet under water and otherwise delaying my work, it was the 25th of January, 1894, when I rejoined Douglas at the glacier. He had been laying off a line for a horse track from Nesbitt's to the terminal face. We now decided to go along the spur on the western side of the glacier and, if necessary, ascend Mount Rune, so as to complete our map of the neve. As Douglas was yet feeling far from well, we asked A. Woodham, one of the diggers, to come and give us a helping hand for the ten days we expected to be away. It was two days before we had our track blazed and camp pitched, 2,700 feet above the flat. The view from Camp 6 of the glacier was quite the prettiest picture we saw, for the glacier could be seen from the neve to near the snout through a framework of nainai and other trees. The nainai is a mountain scrub and grows up to 30 feet in height, its foliage is like a large pineapple head. Some plants have only straight stems with one head, while others have gnarled and twisted limbs with a hundred heads. 
the shape of the tuft on the head of the branches gives a tropical appearance to the scene and as it only grows in any quantity near the grass line on the west coast it is rarely difficult to obtain a foreground of apparently tropical vegetation with a distance of snow and ice a combination at once curious and beautiful the grass line was one thousand feet above camp six and it took woodham and me two and a half days to cut through the scrub for that height i never experienced before or since such an impenetrable tangle of vegetation of stunted hard stubborn akiaki broom etc this mountain scrub to a great extent grows downhill that is when ascending you have the branches pointing towards you consequently it is difficult to get into a shrub to cut a limb off near the ground in places it is not unlike meeting a number of fixed bayonets pointing at you and trying to cut the rifle off at the stock with a billhook without room to swing it properly on the first of february we shouldered our loads and made along the high ridge towards mount moltke but at noon a fog came up and at three p m the dry fog changed to a wet mist a sure sign of a storm we could not see thirty yards ahead so decided to go down on our right and camp because it was the lee side of the ridge and also because the slopes toward the glacier were practically precipices after descending five hundred feet in the fog we came to a precipice and on going to the right and left found more sheer rocks the mist was too thick to see how deep or of what kind these faces were so having found a small patch of scrub growing on the hillside we decided to stay where we were it took an hour to cut a flat shelf six feet by eight feet out of the hillside with our ice axes on this shelf we pitched our fly stretched on a rope between two ice axes and tied down in every possible direction to the long snow grass we were thoroughly wet by this time and the wind was whistling over the ridge above us from the northwest douglas had a dry shirt and i had a pair of light canvas trousers to put on and woodham had a complete change so we hung our wet garments outside there being no chance of a good enough fire to dry them and put our blankets round us we were however able to make a small fire of scrub for boiling the billy and having a good drink of hot cocoa turned in all that night and the next day it blew a hurricane but this did not affect us much as we were on the lee side of the ridge over our heads we could see the grass and lily leaves whirling about having been literally torn up by the roots and between the blinding squalls of rain we watched the sea whipped into one sheet of foam by the squalls the high wind and heavy rain dispersed the fog of the previous day and enabled us to look at our surroundings and see where we had got to a point which we had been unable to decide the previous evening from conway's peak at the extreme south corner of the franz joseph glacier the bismarck range branches off in a northwesterly direction towards the coast dividing for a mile and a half its neve from that of the fox glacier at this point a short ridge the chancellor branches off for five miles nearly due west and a mile and a half further on the bismarck range is mount andereg eight thousand three hundred and sixty feet which sends an offshoot to the west for about seven miles between these two diverging ranges the victoria glacier lies and beyond them the fox glacier flows first along the chancellor ridge and then passing the snout of the victoria glacier continues along the foot of the second range andereg's peak and mount rune seven thousand three hundred and forty four feet which lies a mile north of it gives rise to the fritz glacier which is bounded on the south by the second range and on the north by a spur which comes off mount moltke six thousand five hundred and nine feet a peak a little north of rune the fritz glacier is the source of the waikukpa river on mount moltke is a small ice field which sends its drainage to the east down harper's creek by cape defiance and to the north gives rise to the oemorua river after leaving moltke the bismarck range continues north for four miles sending off several short abrupt spurs to the west between which are valleys some one thousand five hundred feet in depth walled by high precipitous sides these are drained by dry creek which flows into the waiho river six miles below the glacier some idea of the great steepness of these valleys and ridges may be gained by the fact that near the head of dry creek a straight line could be taken for a mile and a quarter in length which would cross three ridges of five thousand ninety feet and two valleys of one thousand five hundred to two thousand feet deep this is often the case on the west coast ranges the main chain of the southern alps sends off more spurs and branch ranges of considerable altitude on the western slope than on the eastern 
all these have deep valleys between them and descend from ten thousand feet and upwards to within five hundred feet of sea level in a distance of less than ten miles those valleys in which there are glaciers present high precipitous sides of rock and in the lower portions the rivers descend through dark bush-clad or bare rocky gorges beautiful scenery but ugly from the unfortunate explorer's point of view on the second of february when the fog cleared we found ourselves camping on a very steep hillside near the head of one of the branches of dry creek the other side of the valley for one thousand feet or more was almost a precipice with grass and stunted scrub clinging to it in places the storm still raged furiously and as our aneroids had fallen one point one zero inches during the night douglas and i put on our wet clothes and made the fly ropes taut gathered some bits of scrub for the fire and retired again to our blankets so long as the wind came from the northwest it was fairly warm and we were more or less sheltered by the spur above us but about two hours after dark it veered round as usual to the southwest and blew with all its force on to our shelter bringing with it hail and sleet instead of rain there is a fixed rule which rarely has an exception as to weather on the west coast namely that northwest wind always brings heavy rain followed by southwest hail and rainstorms for a day and then fine weather again till the next nor'wester as soon as the wind therefore veered round to the southwest we knew that twenty-four hours would see fine weather and as the temperature fell our spirits rose douglas had turned in in his dry shirt i was in my thin canvas trousers only but woodham luckily for himself had on plenty of clothes towards midnight the gale increased and the wind howled round us in furious gusts trying to dislodge the fly which was flapping about in an alarming manner douglas had just said it's deuced lucky that we tied her down so well when a squall struck us again and after a brief struggle with the canvas it broke a rope and in half a second the whole arrangement had gone away in the darkness up we all scrambled douglas and i in our airy costume as there was no time to find and put on our wet clothes and began to struggle with the canvas the wind seemed literally to leap on us driving the hail with almost irresistible force and making it very difficult to rig up any kind of shelter after nearly a quarter of an hour battling with the fly tumbling over one another in the dark and slipping down on the wet and steep grass with our bare feet we managed to put up a rough shelter cold as i was with my almost naked body i almost smiled at douglas's wild appearance seen at intervals in the uncertain light when we came near one another his solitary garment fluttering in the wind and every moment a hasty remark would be heard as he slipped with his bare legs on the wet grass neither douglas in his long years of exploration nor i have had our shelters blown away before and if the hail stung his bare legs as it stung my bare back and chest i feel sure neither of us will ever neglect a precaution which would prevent another such experience as soon as we had any shelter at all we got under it and allowed woodham to finish fixing the ropes we then donned our wet garments having wrung them out and rolled in our wetter blankets lay waiting for dawn poor old douglas was chilled to the bone and i really feared he would be unable to face the storm and journey down at daybreak as soon as the first streak of light allowed us to see woodham began to kindle a fire everything was wet as possible but by burning a candle and dropping the grease onto a piece of rag and lighting that he gradually charred and dried enough twigs to make a blaze in two hours we had a billy full of boiling cocoa and with the help of that soon made douglas warm my young bones and blood did not get the cold into them like his for there is a great difference in the staying powers of a man under thirty and one over fifty years of age at noon the wind was still blowing a gale so we decided to go down to the hospital and leave everything where it was when we reached the top of the ridge the fog came again and we found the force of the wind very great several times we had to lie down for some seconds or we should have been blown away like flies whenever possible we descended and traversed the steep face on the lee side of the ridge at one time we must have been in a thundercloud as our axes hummed in three or four hours we reached the shelter of the bush and at seven p m arrived at the hospital where dry clothes a good fire and hot tea made us happy this was woodham's first experience on the higher country and he said it would be his last he thought it a very poor game but his disgust was only temporary he was far too enterprising a man to be so easily daunted in two days the weather cleared 
and we returned to the scene of our late discomfort to complete our work and bring down the things on the way we called in at camp one at the terminal face and found it blown down and all my photographic plates which had been exposed up the glacier had been exposed a second time to two days rain eventually it proved that not many were spoiled but this is an instance of the difficulties which i had to contend against for my photographs having gone along the ridge beyond our camp to a point from which we could get observation into the neve and complete the map we picked up our camp and returned to the diggers huts the only incident worth mentioning which occurred on our second trip along the ridge was one which might have been a serious accident the outer ranges often have deep and narrow fissures in the rock after reaching the grass line sometimes these are three hundred feet deep or more and only a few feet broad easily hidden by the long snow grass on this spur there were several small ones a foot or two broad and perhaps twenty to fifty feet deep coming down the grass ahead of douglas i heard a cooee from above and being unable to see him on looking up i returned and heard another below me so i went down again thinking i had been mistaken when a third cry came from behind putting down my load i was again ascending when i heard a voice on my right you might pull a chap out of a hole it appears that poor douglas had walked into one of those fissures which was luckily narrow and his load had jammed preventing him from falling below his shoulders we soon had him out none the worse for the mishap on reaching the diggers huts with our various belongings a day or two later we were greeted with news of the gale which had done an immense amount of damage all over the district roads were blocked houses blown down and no prospect of the mail getting through for some time douglas now had another attack of his influenza brought on by the recent chill and he retired down to more comfortable quarters at the lake i stayed on the hospital with the diggers and spent my time in preparing the map and going up and along the burster ridge on the north side of the calorie river to get bearings and photographs into the head of that river and the totra there is gold in the reaches of the river above the gorge and several diggers have been into the upper valley no possible route exists through the gorge itself owing to the very precipitous sides so a track has been blazed up mount muller three thousand seven hundred feet and along the ridge to the grass line this ridge is easy but tiring yet the inhabitants of the district look upon it as a breakneck and difficult journey several young fellows have been so frightened by the travellers tales told by the older diggers that they would sooner do anything than try to go over the burster the calorie river drains mount ellie de beaumont ten thousand two hundred feet which sends down two fine ice fields the burton and the spencer both primary glaciers the saddle at the actual source of the river a mile or two above the burton glacier leads probably into the wataroa river nearly under the lindenfelt saddle which lies at the extreme head of the great tasman glacier at present the topography of the upper waters and tributaries of the wataroa river is very uncertain but i think it is safe to assume that the lindenfeld and calorie saddles lead into the same valley i have never been on the former but knowing the western ranges so well could easily decide the point and hope before long to be able to do so from the burster mount ellie de beaumont is a beautiful cone rising out of the two glaciers to its right mount green nine thousand three hundred and twenty five feet and the minarets are seen rising out of the neve of the same glacier the spencer a pass could be made between green and ellie de beaumont on to the head of the tasman glacier opposite mount darwin about the middle of february we had five days of heavy rain and several slips occurred on the glacier branch causing the bed of the river to rise eight or ten feet with gravel and other debris the result was that the water overflowed its usual flood channels and cutting in behind the wire bridge above the hospital washed away its supports the bridge consequently gradually became less taut and at last touched the water strong as the wire ropes were they hardly resisted the rushing torrent for a second but snapped like twine and the whole structure collapsed a flood of such magnitude is worth seeing on the glacier branch great icebergs which had broken off from the glacier careered madly along crashing and colliding against one another and huge boulders could be heard bumping down under the water in the calorie gorge the water was thirty feet above its normal level and on emerging from its narrow rock-bound channel on to the more open ground it spread out right and left in huge waves trees and stones were swept along with tremendous speed and force after the river subsided we found a mass of ice blocks stranded amongst the trees in the bush by the hut all the claims were filled with debris and unworkable for days 
and in some cases the men had to wait for weeks until the river had scoured out some of the gravel in its bed and lowered its level thus enabling them to get sufficient fall to carry away their tailings as soon as i could find a horse on which to ford the river i went up to the glacier to see what damage the flood had done in places the terminal face had retreated five or six yards owing to the masses of ice which had broken away and at the outlet on the east side there appeared the finest ice cave i have ever had the pleasure of seeing it was one hundred feet high and about the same breadth while quite fifty yards inside a ray of sunlight could be seen coming through some crevasse which had opened through the ice above at that point the cave seemed to still maintain its dimensions but beyond was inky darkness this glacier had since eighteen sixty seven been well known at its terminal face as it only necessitates a ride of fourteen miles up an open river bed from the sea beyond the snout only had been explored twenty years or more before our visit douglas says he remembers hearing of some maoris who were prospecting for gold with the early diggers on the river flats going up to look at the ice at that time it came down to the sentinel rock and the large cave out of which the river flowed was between the muller and the strachan rocks the maoris on seeing this imagined that it was a tunnel through the ranges to some unknown country on the other side from which all gold came so they brought up a large dugout canoe and having obtained some short poles with steel hooks on the end they started into the cave on a voyage of discovery using the hooks against the icy walls after they had gone in some little distance it is presumed a block of ice fell near them or they heard one of the cracks or groans which we so often heard on this glacier because the canoe suddenly shot out into daylight again and her crew jumped ashore saying the typo devil was in the cave i ought perhaps to have mentioned before that waiho means smoky waters it is difficult to decide whether the maoris named it because of the very milky appearance of the water or because of the peculiarly thick white fog which hangs over the stream not encroaching at all on the banks but only covering the actual water the river has more silt coming down it than any other on the coast and its water is very milky at the mouth End of chapter five chapter six of pioneer work in the alps of new zealand by arthur paul harper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan chapter six cook river balfour glacier old moraines beach travelling and digging gillespie's ryan's range balfour glacier a race with the clouds topsy at the end of february instructions came for us to go without delay to cook river and explore all its branches some years ago the track or road which skirts the outer hills southwards from ross was continued from Mapurika across the waiho river some three miles below the glacier and thence over the oimarua and waikukupa rivers to cook river the distance by this road does not exceed twelve miles but it had been allowed to grow over and is now worse to tackle than bush in its natural state why the authorities should have allowed a track which cost a good sum of money to grow over is hard to say possibly because the powers that be in okarito and gillespie's had sufficient influence to prevent its being kept open for it diverted all the southern horse traffic from these two townships however the fact remained that instead of being able to ride in an hour or two from the franz joseph glacier to cook's river we had to go down the waiho to the sea beach and along it to gillespie's township and strike inland some eight miles to a small farm on cook river flats thirty-five miles of bad going taking a day and a half having procured a horse on which to carry our property we left the hospital and our digger friends on the seventh march and followed the waiho river bed to the beach went to the mr gibbs store and farm at waikukupa where we slept beach travelling is a distinct feature at present on the west coast at low tide the sand is generally good but at high tide the traveller is forced up into soft sand or gravel and the going becomes tedious and painful the whole of the lower country is formed of low moraine hills and terraces reaching four hundred feet in height left there by the ancient glaciers these have been cut through here and there by the rivers and in many places they form high bluffs along the seashore at the bottom of which large erratic boulders loosened by the sea are lying in confusion at high tide the surf which is nearly always heavy dashes over this mass of rocks and beats against the hard mass of moraine above them 
some of the bluffs are practically impassable except at low tide and these have had narrow tracks cut over or round them others are in their natural state and are impassable at high water consequently travelling along the beach has its excitement for seas have to be dodged amongst the loose masses of rock strewn along the shore at the foot of a bluff frequently after a storm the sea throws up sand and gravel to such an extent that no rocks are visible and the bluff can be passed on a good beach but the next tide may destroy the good ground and leave the rocks naked again or possibly the bluff may be filled up for weeks two bluffs have to be passed before reaching gibbs's house both easy ones and the oemerua and waikukupa rivers have to be forded at their mouths the rivers often have large lagoons behind the sea wall and these have an outlet into the sea the lagoon filling up at high tide and nearly running out before the next tide to cross the water rushing down over shifting sand is never pleasant and can only be done at lower half tide for the surf causes a strong undercurrent when it runs up the narrow channel against the stream fording when the river is in dangerous condition or without due experience has been the cause of many deaths hardly a river or creek on the coast exists which has not been answerable for one or more lives from the waikukupa we reached gillespie's by noon a township consisting of two public houses a store and a few huts it is indeed difficult to imagine a more dismal or depressing place than gillespie's beach or town as they call it in the district some six or seven huts and houses are scattered along the old sea wall of sand hills in a row facing the sea these include two public houses a government school and one store the other store being part of one public house on approaching it no one is seen about the sandy track which connects the scattered houses but suddenly one of the many canine mongrels which are plentiful here becomes aware of a stranger's presence he gives tongue to his indignation and followed by other curs of low degree notifies to all whom it may concern the fact that someone is coming up to this moment nothing worthy of notice has occurred but no sooner has the signal been given than children of all ages and sexes spring up on every side and after a short stare to see if they know you or not bolt like rabbits to their houses leaving the place again deserted the stranger then feeling that he cannot so insult the publican as not to look in for a drink turns up from the beach to the sand hills and proceeds down the street towards the hotel as he passes each house out come the inhabitants and by the time he has reached the shelter of the bar-room the whole available population of some ten adults and thirty children are gazing at him a few diggers live here working for gold on the beach or just behind the old sea-wall and the rest of the population practically owe their means of livelihood to supplying these men and others in the district this beach combing is sometimes profitable as a great deal of surfacing or black gold-bearing sand is now and then deposited after a storm and can be taken above high water mark before the next tide washes it away again the gold obtained from this sand is very fine sometimes not much coarser than flour above high water mark on the sand hills forming the old sea wall gold-bearing sand is worked in many localities but it is not on the whole profitable only fifteen shillings to thirty shillings a week being made the average however is increased when a rich patch of surfacing is thrown up by a storm and good gold obtained from it by those who are on the qui vive when journeying along the beach huts belonging to men working the black sand are passed at long intervals in lonely seclusion on some flat amongst the tall flax or scrub above the high water mark behind these is generally a piece of swampy ground to the foot of the morainic hills which are covered with tall bush beyond again within twenty miles the great snowy ranges can be seen towering up to ten thousand or twelve thousand feet with dark gloomy valleys and rocky spurs descending very rapidly to the lower country it is a wonderfully fine effect to see this magnificent panorama of mountains so close closed with bush at their base and rising range upon range to their ice-clad summits while standing on the sea beach with the heavy rollers just at one's back crashing onto the shingle and roaring as they retire and draw the stones after them from the beach near the waikukupa to the summit of mount cook is about twenty miles as the crow flies and is eight or nine miles to the foot of the outer flanks of the ranges five hundred feet above sea level therefore the southern alps and their many buttresses rise at this point 
twelve thousand feet in eight miles and can be seen for their whole height a track has been formed from gillespie's township up the cook river flats where mr ryan has a small farm about eight miles distant at the foot of the hills to this we made our way in the afternoon after two hours delay at the store ordering provisions and necessaries all the way down the coast our ice axes had created great curiosity and douglas who is of course known to every man woman and child south of the wanganui river overheard some remarks concerning these dangerous-looking implements four or five men were standing round the swags speculating as to the use of the ice axes the first suggested that they were grubbers which had been sent down for ryan another believed they were picks for fossicking gold in the ranges and so on ad lib at last a brilliant idea struck someone and he said why their fixings charlie has invented for spearing eels this appeared to solve the difficulty as they adjourned for a drink cook river has as i have already explained three branches the fox the balfour and the main branch the first name comes from the fox glacier which drains the dividing range from conway's peak to mount tasman and is bounded on the east by the bismarck range and its branches on the west by craig's range a high offshoot from mount tasman running northwest the balfour river flows from the glacier of that name lying between the latter range and the balfour range which branches off the divide from near the silberhorn of tasman and runs due west for nine or ten miles the main branch takes its rise from la perouse a fine glacier which drains the divide from the silberhorn of tasman to mount stokes and flows west between the balfour and copeland ranges the latter range is an offshoot of mount stokes and runs a little north of west past mount copeland seven thousand eight hundred and ninety five feet and little's peak seven thousand three hundred and eighty six feet to ryan's peak at this point it branches in two directions the northerly spur coming down close to the lower extremity of craig's range having curled round past the lower end of the balfour range the main branch of the river is joined by the balfour stream about three miles before it leaves the hills and after flowing for three or four miles on the flat country is joined by the fox river the hut to which we went on ryan's farm after leaving gillespie's is situated a mile or so above the inflow of the latter river at the point where it leaves the hills the main stream is spanned by a wire rope and cage placed there for the benefit of three or four men who are digging a mile further up on the south bank gold has been obtained in the main branch and balfour river but is now nearly all worked out only two claims existing at the present our plan of campaign was firstly to make an ascent on the lower end of the copeland range towards ryan's peak in order to get some general observations and photographs into the upper portions of the two branches and the surrounding peaks and then make our way to the balfour glacier taking the fox glacier and the main branch afterwards on march twelfth we took our camp to near the diggers huts and began to cut the track up a spur behind them it took two days before we had cleared a track and pitched our camp at three thousand feet and owing to wet and foggy weather it was the seventeenth before we were able to do our work on the top of the range even then we should have been unsuccessful had we not made a point of reaching our station by seven a m so as to finish the bearing before the fog came however luck was on our side and we were able to fix the station and return with the camp to the diggers huts by the evening of the seventeenth from the shoulder of ryan's peak we got a good idea of the topographical features of the watershed of cook river and could see the dividing range from mount ellie de beaumont to the footstool this is a good example of west coast work as compared with that of the eastern slopes of the southern alps it will be seen that to fix a station at five thousand feet took us six days necessitating a camp at three thousand feet whereas on the eastern side of the main range with its open grassy slopes and more certain climate the whole thing could have been done in one day from our lower camp on march eighteenth we moved off again crossing by the cage to the opposite side of the river and pitching camp in a perfect deluge of rain about half a mile above the diggers huts everything we had was wet so the following morning was spent drying a few things before a large fire and at noon we continued up the river to the inflow of the balfour stream at which point another craig's creek also joins the river flowing from a small ice field on craig's peak douglas had explored this branch some years previously and found the gorge impassable the route therefore lay up the creek 
for a mile or more and thence over the spur which comes from craig's peak to the gorge a climb of about four thousand feet accordingly we turned up the creek which comes down very rapidly over large stones and between rocky sides a stiff piece of going for us with our usual handicap of fifty pounds towards evening we reached a large erratic boulder about forty feet high and two hundred and fifty feet in circumference under which we could find very fair shelter for the night so we kindled a fire and turned in even this little valley had signs of ancient ice the sides were two thousand feet high and showed terraces of smooth ice-worn rocks it is possible that a glacier originally came from craig's peak down here and joined the main ice streams but the valley is so short that it is difficult to account for a body of ice large enough to leave such distinct marks and so many erratics half a mile above the bivouac a tributary stream comes off the spur over which we were going we therefore next morning followed it up for half an hour and then pitched the batwing in the last patch of mountain scrub douglas on his previous visit had found some good crystals on this spur so we spent the day crystal hunting and found some nice specimens i took my camera to the ridge some seventeen hundred feet above camp but failed to secure views owing to the inevitable fog on the twenty first i made an early start with my load in order to obtain some photographs before the fog obscured the higher ranges leaving douglas to follow at his leisure the view from the ridge will ever live in my memory as one of the most striking i know from a long range because not only was it of surpassing grandeur but of more than ordinary interest in the first place no one could suppose from a distance that there was room for more than a small valley here but on closer inspection there proved to be not only a broad valley and glacier but a comparatively large tributary valley the reason of this is that the ranges are of exceptional steepness and very narrow allowing room for broad valleys between the point on which we were standing was upwards of five thousand feet above sea level and overlooking a quadrangular basin seven miles in length and increasing in breadth from one mile at the upper to two miles at the lower end the floor of which lay two thousand five hundred feet below a spur from the balfour range and that on which we were standing forms the western wall of this basin a deep gorge having been cut through it by the river craig's range and the balfour ranges form the northern and southern sides respectively while the eastern end is blocked by the stupendous buttresses of mount tasman on the north and south of the valley the sides rise in rocky precipices to the height of more than two thousand feet and at the western end mount tasman rises fully seven thousand feet its black and frowning cliffs only relieved by one small ice field which lies halfway up its sides the small glacier is apparently of second-rate importance but so far as was then known it formed the neve of the balfour that a large glacier six miles long should draw its supplies from so small a neve was more than doubtful and i was of opinion that the snowfield which we could see between the balfour range and mount dampier would prove to be the real neve coming through some unsuspected gap in that range this point we could not determine from here and hoped to finally settle it by going up the glacier there is only one small flow of ice joining the neve and trunk of this glacier most of the ice drops over a cliff over one thousand feet in height bringing with it a great deal of debris which covers the glacier with heavy moraine for its whole length over the balfour range mounts dampier hicks and stokes could be seen with harper's saddle at the head of the hooker glacier and behind again dominating all was the upper part of mount cook these great peaks rose in apparently a wall within seven miles of us seven thousand or eight thousand feet of their height being visible the original name given to mount stokes was la parousse and it seems a pity to have changed it how appropriate the latter name is cannot be realized better than from craig's spur because from this point there is a group of peaks standing alone and from their position dwarfing all others this group could hardly be surpassed and being all closely connected should have similar names at present the name stokes spoils the uniformity and if la perouse were again adopted we should be able to call the group of five navigators namely tasman eleven thousand four hundred and seventy five feet dampier eleven thousand three hundred and twenty three feet cook twelve thousand three hundred and forty nine feet hicks ten thousand four hundred and ten feet and la perouse ten thousand one hundred and one feet fortunately 
I had an hour or two on the top to obtain photographs before nine-thirty, when the fog closed in upon us. Douglas having arrived in due course, we began our descent over steep treacherous grass slopes and bare rocks, and in two hours arrived at the terminal moraine of the glacier, and pitched our fly, having left the bat-wing behind, to lighten our loads. When travelling with a fly only, we arrange it as follows. Placing a pole horizontally, about five feet from the ground between two uprights, we hang the canvas over and peg it to the ground behind, giving it a slope of forty-five degrees. The front is then stretched out, and the corners made fast at three feet, and the centre at four feet from the ground. The two ends of this lean-to are blocked with screens of scrub and fern, making walls of about three feet in width. Under the back part we place our bedding, which consists of twigs, branches, and grass, and kindle our fire in the shelter of the front portion. The bed is about the same size as in our bat-wing, namely six feet by four feet, and on turning in we lie heads and tails in our blanket bags. This shelter is practically the same as our bat-wings, only with walls of fern at the ends instead of canvas, but it has the disadvantage of only a single instead of a double canvas roof. To remedy this in heavy rain, we make a large screen of ferns or grass, and fix it about six inches above the back portion, letting it act as the fly does in the bat-wing camp. However good the quality of canvas, a certain amount of moisture always comes through in heavy rain, either in drops where the roof has been touched, or in fine spray, hence the necessity of an extra roof over the portion in which we sit or sleep. A single piece of oiled canvas would be waterproof in any weather, but has not sufficient lasting qualities, for it dries and cracks in a few weeks, and being nearly twice as heavy as ordinary canvas, it is just as convenient to take two pieces of the latter, if one takes any. Our camp was situated on the bank of McKenna's Creek, which drains some ice fields on Craig's Peak, and the range to the east. The valley in which the creek flows is broad and flat, for two and a half miles, and is separated from the Balfour Glacier by an ice-worn, narrow ridge which we named Hen and Chickens, descending from fifteen hundred feet at the upper end of the valley to five hundred feet at the lower end. This ridge has been abraded by ice on both sides, and on the top for a greater part of its length. A few chains below our camp the creek joins the Balfour River, at a point about a quarter of a mile below the glacier. After leaving the ice, the river flows on a fairly level course, through a series of terminal moraines, some of no great antiquity. There are five terraces of old lateral moraines along the lower part of the glacier, and three of these have their corresponding semicircular terminal moraines, from which the position of the glacier at different periods of its existence can be determined. The highest terrace of these five was formed by the ice when the glacier reached the present gorge, or possibly when it pushed its way still further through the narrow outlet. Almost immediately below the inflow of McKenna's Creek, the valley begins a rapid descent, and the river becomes a rushing torrent over, under, and through large erratic boulders, until half a mile below it leaps into a gloomy gorge walled by sheer rocky precipices of fully one thousand feet. Though I could see generally that the gorge narrowed and descended very rapidly, and also the enormous precipices overhead, it was impossible, owing to scrub and boulders, to obtain a photograph of more than a general idea of the gorge. It is a most helpless feeling to get mixed up with the large boulders met with in such places. One feels like Gulliver in his journeys amongst the giants, and can often neither get under or over one of these smooth-sided obstacles. The Balfour joins Cook River about three miles from the glacier and must have a descent of 1,500 feet in a little under two miles while passing through the gorge. On March 22nd, we traversed the glacier from the terminal face to the foot of the precipices off Tasman, Douglas taking the southern and I the northern side. Rain, however, set in at noon, and by 3 p.m., when we reached the foot of Tasman, the clouds were so low that we could see nothing. It was therefore impossible to clear up the doubt about the neve of the glacier, but we still inclined to the opinion that the snowfield from Mount Hicks found an outlet into the Balfour, otherwise it was difficult to account for so large a trunk. The ice was completely covered with surface moraine, nearly every stone of which sparkled with minute crystals, and some of the larger stones bristled with crystals an inch long. My diary entry for March 23rd begins as follows, quote, 
two and one half miles of creek bed seven hundred feet climb at the end fifty-five minutes exciting race with fog thought i'd done it sold End quote. such races with the fog to obtain bearings or photographs from a high point were constantly taking place and i think the fog has won as often as i have on this particular occasion i wanted to get a clear view from a point at the head of mckenna's creek which should finally settle the doubt with regard to the balfour neve my route lay through some rather bad scrub for two hundred yards and then along an open creek bed for two and one quarter miles to the foot of a saddle which lay nearly seven hundred feet above the creek i took betsy the dog who by the way rejoined us after leaving the waiho and travelled at a jog trot to the foot of the grassy slope of the saddle because i had seen a small insignificant piece of fog form and disappear again on ryan's peak below the gorge by the time the foot of the saddle had been reached a dense bank of fog was crawling through the balfour gorge and had apparently met an opposing current of air from mckenna's creek as it remained stationary to all appearances at the lower end of the valley the saddle i was making for lay on the above-mentioned ice-worn rocky ridge between the creek and the glacier and as it would be only three or four miles from tasman's great cliffs it ought to command a grand view of the western face of that peak i had just begun the ascent when a wisp of fog came over the top of the ridge through another saddle and i realized that though it had stopped at the end of mckenna valley it was passing up the balfour glacier on the far side of the hen and chickens never did i travel uphill so fast before betsy now barking and biting my heels now running ahead was madly excited while i scrambled frantically up to get at least one photograph the fog now crept along the mckenna valley and was close up to me when i reached the bridge thoroughly done having travelled just over two miles along the creek and climbed seven hundred feet in fifty-five minutes with twenty pounds of camera instruments etc on my back it was all to no purpose however for though i had raced the fog behind in the mckenna valley it had crawled up along the balfour ridge and only allowed me a momentary glimpse of tasman's giant buttresses obscuring everything above the six thousand foot level before i could get my camera out of its case did you swear i am generally asked when relating this experience no i did not say anything at all i merely upset a large rock lying near me over the eight hundred foot precipice under the balfour glacier to relieve my mind and then lay down to recover my wind it happens so often this mad rush uphill to forestall the fog that one gets used to disappointments the only way to secure good photographs is to reach the point by six or seven o'clock in the morning and sit down quietly until the light improves directly the first bit of fog forms anywhere in sight a set of plates ought to be exposed whether the light is good or bad never wait till the last minute but secure one set at least and if the fog does give a farther chance of exposing in better light then take another set i have seen the whole landscape blotted out within three minutes of the first sign of fog and as i was waiting till the last minute to let the light improve i was on that occasion badly sold and never again did i omit to make one complete set of exposures on arrival the rocks above me on craig's range were broken into very fantastic shapes and numerous detached blocks lay on the hens and chickens which I believe to have been left by the ancient glacier. Betsy and I spent two hours on the ridge, trying to catch some kias, and also dropping stones over the great precipice onto the glacier below. A most fascinating occupation is this, of rolling stones from a great height. Douglas and I have spent hours, when waiting for a fog to lift, in various places, rolling down large rocks, and working as hard as if our lives depended on it, to dislodge one of exceptional dimensions we often used to try and suggest some reason which would account for the fascination for i suppose it may be said to be universal i have never met a man even amongst those who spend their whole lives on these hills who did not only thoroughly enjoy seeing a stone career madly down a slope but who would not go to considerable trouble to start one rolling on returning along mckenna's creek we got two ducks but the dog took them both to the far side of the creek and left them there compelling me to wade across for them a cold task as the stream was ice-fed and took me up to the waist douglas some years before i joined him used to work alone and had a wonderfully clever and awful useful dog named topsy which used to keep him well supplied with birds she would go away to hunt as soon as he began to pitch camp and return with three birds two for her master and one for herself 
it would be a very poor locality for birds if she couldn't find any a better forager never existed in another way too she proved useful douglas says that when going up a river he might find a rocky bluff rising out of the water which seemed likely to necessitate a high climb in order to avoid the risk of going forward some distance and being compelled to return owing to an impassable corner he would send topsy ahead and sit down for a smoke till she came back on her return he could always tell from her manner whether the route was practicable round the bluff so well did she know what he could do that on one occasion she gave him to understand that there was no possibility of going round but as he was anxious to avoid the high climb through the bush over the bluff he picked up his load and started off to find his way round topsy who was lying down merely looked up and seeing him going where she had been stayed where she was and made no attempt to follow knowing her master would have to return to that spot to begin his climb over when douglas came back having failed he said topsy got up stretched herself and followed him up the hillside with a superior smile on her face the weather became very threatening on the twenty fourth so we decided to get out of this valley before a storm came on and stopped us as provisions were coming to an end and we had done all that was necessary the very steep grass slopes and smooth rock faces up which we had to go to reach the spur again were treacherous and would have been very dangerous but for our ice axes it was annoying to have to take such a high and roundabout route to and from this glacier when had the gorge been passable it would have only taken an hour or two to reach the junction with cook river instead of a long day on easter sunday the storm came on so we pushed along from our bivouac where we slept on the previous evening and reached ryan's hut before dark a week's bad weather followed putting all the streams into high flood therefore we had good reason to congratulate ourselves on having got out of the balfour valley in time for another day's delay and we should have been cornered like rats in a trap without the cheese one evening some of the diggers working up cook river above the cage who had been down to town gillespies called in at the hut on their way back and stayed for the night conversation turned to ice work and after explaining the use of our axes i began to give them a rough idea of the effects of glaciers in the course of the conversation i spoke of the tasman glacier and one of those present said is the tasman as large as the fox river oh yes much larger i said is it on a big river too said another to which i replied yes the waitaki what a rum thing said the last speaker it is that nearly all the glaciers are on rivers it is curious i said humbly feeling ashamed that my discourse had not conveyed a better idea of the causes and effects of glaciers End of chapter six Chapter Seven of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Seven Cook River, Fox Glacier. Slight Mishap, Douglas, the Chancellor Ridge, Victoria Glacier, Kias, Fogged Again. Even when out of the ranges, our communication with the civilized world was casual. A weekly pack-horse mail came as far as Gillespie's Beach, and was generally punctual, except when rain put some of the rivers in flood, which occurred about twice out of five trips, and then we had to be thankful if there was only a week's delay. In addition to this, many of the inhabitants at Gillespie's are not on speaking terms, and as we relied on the thoughtfulness of someone coming up to the hut to bring our letters, it often happened that the person who came had not been to the post office because he was not on good terms with the people there on returning from the balfour valley we found letters awaiting us in the hut urging that our reports be completed and sent to the office in hokitika before we again went into the ranges this took some days and when i had completed my portion of the writing i decided to go to the fox glacier and work there until douglas had finished his report and could join me regardless of possible bad luck i left ryan's hut on all fools day eighteen ninety four with johnny ryan taking food for a fortnight batwing etc in two forty-pound loads on a pack-horse the snout of the fox glacier which lies six hundred and seventy feet above sea level is easily reached but at present a horse cannot be taken within a mile of the ice 
If, however, a track was cleared through the bush, there would be little need of formation, and a horse could go to the terminal face with little trouble. At a mile and a half below the glacier, I sent Ryan back with the horses, as they were of no further use, and leaving one load to bring up later, I started up the river with the other. The travelling was rather rougher than I expected, and it was 2 p.m. before I found a good camping place amongst some rata bushes near a tributary creek. Returning for and bringing up the second load occupied another two hours, leaving just enough daylight to clear a space and pitch the bat wing. When there is a probability of staying more than one night in a camp, we put some flat stones under the fire to keep it dry, and also a few between the bedding and the fire, as it is more comfortable and cleaner than the bare, damp ground. Intending to be here for a week at least, I made the camp as snug as possible before dark, and having had a meal, proceeded to read the papers which had come up by the mail before I left Ryan's. The Fox Glacier had been visited during the previous twenty-five years by many who were either in search of fine scenery or gold, but no one had been beyond the terminal face. The map then existing, as in the case of most of the western watershed, was made from distant trigonometrical stations on the sea bluffs and lower hills, and I anticipated some interesting work on such a large field of virgin ice. It was a decided drawback being alone, but still one man can do a great deal by himself with due care, even on a glacier. The valley is broader than that of the Franz Joseph. The northern side rises nearly sheer from the ice, in high precipitous hills, a considerable amount of bare, ice-worn rock showing here and there through the dark vegetation. The southern side for the first three miles slopes gently back from the glacier for some distance, showing several old lateral moraines and terraces to the foot of Craig's Range, which rises abruptly for some three thousand or four thousand feet. The terraces and hillsides are clothed with dense bush and scrub to the usual altitude. On the right-hand side of the terminal face, when approaching the glacier, a large isolated rock stands in the centre of the valley, which appears to be a perfect cone from below, but is in reality a narrow, glacier-worn ridge of nearly a mile in length. The ice, which, at a comparatively recent date, divided and flowed down on each side of the rock, now only flows along its northern face. The cone rock, as we named it, is 825 feet from base to summit, and shows marks of abrasion by ice all over it, with a number of huge erratic boulders strewn along its narrow ridge. These, however, are not seen until one is on the top, because the trees grow to a considerable size wherever they can obtain a hold. On the south side, a large creek coming off Craig's Range, down a steep course, flows against the cone and is turned at right angles to its original direction, and, continuing along the foot of the rock for a mile, joins the main river a few yards below the glacier. About half a mile from the river, up this creek, I made my camp, at the foot of the cone rock, in a nice patch of rata trees. The first thing to do next morning was to ascend the rock, and obtain a good general view of the glacier, to form some idea of the route to take up the ice. On reaching the top, I found it heaped with large erratic blocks, lying in hopeless confusion on one another along the narrow ridge, and sometimes from their size and position rather troublesome. Fine rata trees were growing amongst and on the top of these, and prevented my getting a clear view or opening for a photograph. I generally use my ice axe, by an arrangement of my own, for a camera stand, never carrying a tripod, as we must economize weight in every way. Here, however, a stand would have been useless, for the trees were too large, so climbing a rata until I could overlook its neighbors, I arranged cross sticks between two branches, and made three exposures, one of which ultimately proved very good, the others having been spoilt by movement. From such a central position as the cone, a capital idea of the glacier can be obtained. Of the dividing range, Glacier Peak and Hedinger could be seen rising out of the Neve, while more to the right the top of Tasman was visible over Craig's Peak. From the Neve the ice descends over a good icefall, part of which is in view from the cone, and thence for three or four miles the glacier flows white and smooth to the terminal face. Two small portions of broken ice form the only apparent obstacles to easy travel as far as the great icefall. In the map then existing, the Fox Glacier was shown as flowing down in two large streams, divided by the Chancellor Ridge, a branch of the Bismarck Range. 
the southern ice flow drained the dividing range and the northern came from the snowfields of bismarck's peak i had fully anticipated a magnificent view of two great ice falls descending on each side of the chancellor ridge and joining at its base but there was nothing of the kind visible from the cone presumably because the northern stream or victoria glacier flowed at a lower level and joined the fox without an ice fall below the chancellor ridge the descent of the glacier is gradual not nearly so steep as the franz joseph and its course is over a smoother bed no obstacles apparently to cause such broken waves and undulations as were seen on its neighbour having decided on the best route to follow in order to reach the chancellor ridge i climbed from my high perch in the rata tree to the ground though not very superstitious i have one or two harmless ideas about luck and one is that the first of april is an unlucky day to start on an expedition however up to this point all had gone well i had a good camp plenty of provisions the promise of a day or two of really fine weather and a fine glass here to explore but such good fortune was not to last for on descending from the top of the cone i had to go along a ledge overhanging a drop of about twenty-five feet in the middle of which a single tree had to be passed catching a branch in one hand i was in the act of swinging round on the outside when the limb broke and sent me backwards over the drop at the bottom of which i landed with one leg somewhere under my back before rising i naturally looked at my camera which was under me with some apprehension and found it unhurt but on getting up to go on the pain in my ankle showed that it had been badly twisted there is only one thing to do in a case like this namely keep moving to prevent the joint from stiffening an hour's hobbling brought me to camp where i filled the billy with water cut two days supply of firewood and generally fixed up the camp before resting within a quarter of an hour of sitting down i could not put my foot to the ground and had the pleasure of lying in camp during the third and fourth before i could move about at all freely an accident like this though slight would be quite enough to lead to fatal results if it occurred far away from camp because no anxiety would be felt by those on the low country for a week or two at least generally indeed two or three months might pass before a search party would be organized as we often do not know how long we are going to be away even allowing that a search party was sent out within a week or two they would not know where to begin operations as the country would only be known to the object of their search douglas who has in the past done most of his explorations alone has been fortunate except in one or two cases one of which would have proved fatal but for his extraordinary pluck and determination it was if i recollect rightly from his account in the seventies that he was crossing the swamp between the karangarua and cook river jumping from quote, niggerhead end quote, to quote, niggerhead end quote, when he slipped and sprained his ankle badly he only had a little oatmeal with him and was nearly two weeks before he could get to hunt's beach the nearest habitation on coming some days after to the river karangarua he found it was rising for rain had been falling but in spite of his ankle and the fact that he couldn't swim he crossed that evening and reached the hut thoroughly exhausted he says it was a case of neck or nothing because had he not crossed that night the river would have been too high and a day or two more of exposure would have been too much for him had he had any matches to kindle a fire he would have got on much better but even though it had been raining most of the time he was without fire and only a little shelter making a crossbow he killed two pigeons but the bow soon lost its spring and except these two birds he had to rely on three pounds of oatmeal and a chew or two of tobacco had the accident occurred in the bush probably more birds could have been obtained and a good shelter built but this was in an almost open swamp the fact that my little mishap and douglas's accident turned out to be harmless is no excuse for working alone nor does it alter the rule that a man should never go into rough country away from habitation by himself but we cannot always act according to rules however sound they are it is often a choice of doing the work alone or not at all and if no one took any risk the country would be unexplored for years i must plead guilty to having done a fair amount of solitary work and to liking it quite as well as if not better than with a companion but i admit that it is a mistake on the fifth i went up the glacier some three miles to a point where the ice fall could be seen to advantage the route lay up the creek from camp for half a mile or so to the upper end of the cone rock though at the time i did not anticipate more than three hundred yards before reaching the ice 
a few chains below the end of the rock the creek bed turns at right angles up craig's range from which it flows and at the bend there is an old water course from the glacier into the creek down which there has been an outflow of water from the ice at no distant date by taking this route a rough piece of going is avoided caused by the cone rock having compressed the glacier into a narrow channel as far as the ice is concerned one can get on or off almost anywhere along the sides except where high rocky precipices render it impossible to land travelling on the glacier is easy to anyone accustomed to ice work and it only has to be left once in order to skirt a small icefall nearly three miles up here there was so late in the year a short piece of complicated work amongst crevasses about a mile and a half from the terminal face there is a quarter of an hour of roughish ice which had to be manoeuvred rather carefully but which would give no trouble whatever earlier in the year soon after midday i had reached the small icefall and having thus far seen no sign of the ice of the victoria glacier i began to suspect some great error in the map landing on the south side immediately below the rough ice thirty minutes climbing and crawling over large boulders forming a lateral moraine brought me to the rocky point of a spur off craig's peak round the foot of which the glacier bends from this point of vantage looking across to the chancellor ridge it was evident that no tributary ice stream joined the main glacier nor indeed did it appear that any glacier existed behind the ridge because no water was visible coming over the rocks the glacier is narrower here than its neighbour but its total average width is slightly more the surface ice is good and though hummocky is fairly free from crevasses the only surface moraine is at the terminal face which is covered from side to side for perhaps a hundred and fifty yards up the glacier it would be necessary to cross over the chancellor ridge in order to settle the doubt concerning the victoria glacier but my ankle was still too weak for a long day's work so i returned to camp on the following day i got up at dawn intending to take blanket and provisions for a bivouac on the chancellor ridge but the foot was still stiff and required another day's spell therefore after going halfway up to a small icefall i gave it best and went back to camp it was evident that the sore ankle would not allow much work if i carried even a light load so i decided to only take a quarter plate camera and one day's food and trust to luck in the shape of a good stone if necessary to sleep out on the chancellor ridge leaving camp at dawn or six a m on the seventh i reached the rock bluff below the icefall in two hours and went on to the foot of the fall to see if any practicable route could be found up to the neve though not stupendously broken as the upper part of the france joseph the icefall of the fox glacier would be better left alone as the seracs are large and constantly falling turning back again towards the lower end of the chancellor ridge i intended to cross it and if possible go up some peak or saddle on the bismarck range to command a view of the fritz glacier and head of the waikukupa river at the lower end of the ridge it was easy to reach the side which is of smooth rock sloping gently under the ice about above and below the glacier is lined by sheer and in places overhanging precipices of four hundred or five hundred feet in height at the foot of this rocky wall the ice flows level and unbroken it was not rotten or crevassed as is the usual case at the side of a glacier in one place it was possible to walk up to the foot of the cliff and standing on the ice lean my back against the rock only a foot or less space intervening the ice is evidently of great depth at the side here which accounts for its unbroken surface and the rock must be perpendicular for a considerable distance below the level of the glacier it was now evident that there was a fair-sized glacier in the valley between the chancellor ridge and the bismarck range as a large stream of dirty water fell over the precipices making a fine waterfall it had worn a curiously shaped funnel down the face which completely hid the stream until quite close to it and which accounted for my not seeing it from the opposite side of the glacier the old saying more haste less speed is generally true but never more so than in new country as i have often found to my cost after leaving the ice and being in too great a hurry to reach a good point of view into the valley beyond the chancellor ridge i began to climb up and across the lower end of the spur this is very steep and rotten and the whole face being shattered rock it was not without considerable trouble that i reached the arete having got into one or two decidedly ticklish places in half an hour i topped the ridge and could see into the valley beyond where lay 
three hundred feet below me, the Victoria Glacier, slightly over four miles in length, and about thirty chains in breadth, covered with a very heavy surface moraine for a third of its length. This glacier comes off the Bismarck Range, from Bismarck's Peak and Mount Anderegg, with two tributary glaciers, from the Chancellor Ridge on the south, and from a long offshoot of Anderegg on the north. It flows past the end of the Chancellor onto a plateau, 3,685 feet, lying at the top of the perpendicular rocky wall already described, which rises out of the Fox Glacier. Large erratic boulders lie scattered on the plateau, amongst dense mountain scrub and grass, showing that in the past the Victoria found its way over the cliffs to the main ice flow of the Fox. As it exists at present, the Victoria is as perfect an example of a small primary glacier as could be found, with its little neve, tributary ice streams, and complete system of surface, lateral, and terminal moraines. I had been looking for a likely alpine pass to the Tasman Valley since the beginning of the season, and had come to the conclusion that, for all practical purposes, the Franz Josef Glacier had better be left alone, so far as its lower extremity was concerned. There now appeared to be a good route up the Victoria Glacier, over a low call, to the head of the Fritz Glacier, and thence, behind Rune, to the head of the Melchior, a branch of the Franz Josef Glacier, and then across the broad Neve Basin of the latter, over Graham's Saddle, near De La Beche, down the Rudolph Glacier to the Tasman. I had been close up to Graham's Saddle from the Tasman, and knew the Franz Josef Glacier and the Victoria, so excepting the call over the Bismarck Range, there was little new ground to cover. Therefore, while I was in Christchurch during the winter following this trip, I tried to persuade someone to come and make this pass, and though Mr. Fife arranged to join me, he was at the last moment unable to do so. However, I am glad to say, I ultimately had the satisfaction of being one of the party to make the first complete pass, as will be seen later, when I told Mr. Fitzgerald of the route, and with him and Zerbriggen crossed it a year later. Ever since sunrise, I had been the object of considerable attention from some kias, or mountain parrots, at first only two or three, but afterwards their number had increased to fifteen or more. They joined me on the south side of the Fox Glacier, and annoyed me considerably by their inquisitiveness while I was taking some bearings and photographs, one of them alighting on my back, just as I was looking through the compass. These birds are not found except in high country, and their eggs are very rare, as they probably choose some crevice in the face of a precipice for their nesting place. They have cruel beaks and great power in them, being able to tear any cloth with a single stroke but are tame and harmless, except in certain localities where they kill sheep. This weakness of theirs has given them a bad name, and it is generally supposed that all kias are naturally inclined to attack sheep. Such, however, is not the case. The fault lay in the first instance with shepherds or persons who had to skin the sheep on the station. Kias naturally feed on berries, but they are possessed of an intense desire to investigate everything they see, and if possible tear it with their beaks. Consequently, near homesteads in Otago and Canterbury, when they see sheepskins hanging up to dry, they go down to examine them. If the skins are carefully cleaned, little harm results, but if not, the kias have a chance to taste the fat, and when once a kia tastes fat, he is a ruined bird, and would sell his soul, if he had one, to get more. To satisfy this craving, he attacks the sheep with fatal effect, causing in some localities very heavy loss to the stations. Note. These birds, when attacking live sheep, settle on the back of the animal and deliberately drive their beaks into the skin until they have reached the kidney fat. They never wound a sheep in any other part of the body. End of note. The birds are not migratory, and as far as I have been able to ascertain, rarely leave the valleys they live in. This is evidenced by the fact that while some stations lose many sheep, owing to the kias, an adjoining owner may suffer no loss whatever, owing to the fact that the birds have not learnt the taste for fat. When crossing the Chancellor Ridge, the kias which I referred to followed me on the wing, but owing to the ice being very slippery, my progress was too slow for them. Therefore, alighting on the ice, they began to follow on foot. Whenever a kia makes its appearance, we are prepared for some good fun, as their actions are most ludicrous, and their conversation, which is incessant, is almost expressive enough to enable one to understand what they mean. I have had considerable experience with these birds, but have never seen such an intensely funny proceeding as on this particular morning. 
the keas having settled on the ice began to follow in a long straggling line about fifteen of them they have a preternaturally solemn walk but when in a hurry they hop along on both feet looking very eager and very much in earnest to see these fifteen birds hopping along behind in a string as if their very lives depended on keeping me in sight was ridiculously comic the ice was undulating with little valleys and hummocks and the birds would now for a second or two disappear into a hollow and now show up on a hummock pause for a moment and then hop down again out of sight into the next hollow to judge by their expressions and manner they were in a great state of anxiety on emerging from a hollow on to a hummock as to whether i was still there now and then the one in front would appear craning his neck and on seeing me still ahead would turn round and shriek yeah as much as to say it's all right boys come up and along and the others putting their heads down would set their teeth and travel all they knew a fat one in the rear evidently making very heavy weather of it on the chancellor ridge they became offensively inquisitive and i really could hardly take any photographs owing to their anxiety to ascertain the maker's name on my camera however such is the perversity of affairs in general that it was only when it occurred to me that a picture of ten or fifteen kias examining my ice axe would be interesting that they suddenly seemed to remember an appointment elsewhere and disappeared had the idea occurred a few minutes earlier a good picture could have been obtained after having descended to the victoria glacier i saw a small cloud appearing on craig's range which warned me that the usual fog was coming so i hastened back to the ridge and along it to a point from which i could get a view over the neve of the fox glacier the climb gradually developed into a race with the mists creeping up the valley behind me on reaching the top i was rewarded by a momentary but magnificent view of haidinger and the great northern face of tasman before the fog descended like a curtain and shut everything from view leaving no time to take a photograph i have been fortunate enough to have been all over the central part of our alps and to have seen the great peaks both far and near from every side and i think the northern face of mount tasman is as fine as anything i know except perhaps mount sefton it rises out of the neve of the fox glacier in great brown precipices capped with hanging glaciers and the graceful curves of the summit are unsurpassed for beauty when the fog had once closed in and shut out surrounding objects it is really little use waiting for it to clear but for some reason i always hope against hope and spend a miserable hour or two under a rock before finally giving it up as useless on this occasion i stayed for nearly two hours on the side of the ridge now and then catching a fleeting glimpse of the main glacier far below me winding in ghostly whiteness down the valley and beyond it the sea with its two or three lines of breakers crawling in towards the beach of the upper portion of the valley nothing was again visible beyond one tantalizing peep of tasman's mighty shoulders appearing over the fog at one thirty i could not see an object fifteen yards away and the dry fog changed to a wet mist a sure sign of an approaching storm so i began to cast about for a shelter in which to spend the night and from which to make an ascent on the bismarck range if the morrow proved fine however in half an hour the drifting mist having wetted my clothes completely i gave up all idea of staying out for the night and decided to get back to my camp without delay end of chapter seven chapter eight of pioneer work in the alps of new zealand by arthur paul harper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan chapter eight fox glacier continued return to camp unpleasant surprise result Weckus back to ryan's remarks on the glacier to return in such a dense fog was by no means easy especially as i could not think of descending the rotten rocks up which i had come in the morning for even had it been possible to find a route the falling stones would have been too risky fortunately my bump of locality is strong and by dint of dropping sliding and scrambling over steep faces of unpleasantly smooth rocks and slippery grass i managed to hit off the point to a nicety at which to cross the ice on reaching the south bank and skirting the small icefall the few minutes work amongst the crevasses gave some trouble in the fog it is no easy matter to travel down a glacier even when one knows it well in such a dense white mist 
but to find a good route after only once traversing it was rather difficult business after travelling till five p m it seemed that i had gone far enough to have reached the point where i first took the ice in the morning there are no large stones on the glacier by which to guide one's course so it was not surprising to find on turning towards the bank that i had gone about one hundred yards too far and was abreast of the precipice under the cone rock another half hour however saw me on my way to the camp and though wet to the skin decidedly pleased at being well out of an awkward position and looking forward to dry clothes good fire and snug camp hurrying along in the deluge of rain which had set in splashing down the creek and clambering over the boulders i arrived at the camp about ten minutes before dark instead of my comfortable little shelter and dry clothes i found only a wreck the bat-wing and a quarter of the fly had been burnt the little canvas bags of food and the pea-rifle which usually hung on the ridge-pole under the fly were lying scorched on the ground in one corner a heap of ashes a button or two and a large hole in the scrub bedding were all that remained of my dry clothes this was the crowning disaster of an unlucky expedition a man familiar with his virgil would probably have consoled himself by saying forsen et he olum meminis ajuvabit i fear however that i made some other remark not in latin and did not think of virgil till afterwards with only a few minutes of twilight to work in i commenced to fix up some sort of shelter out of the remains in which to pass the night a more weatherproof shelter would have to be left till the morning in spite of the heavy rain the fly i pitched as we had had it on the balfour glacier and one end was blocked to a height of two feet with a few branches this was all that could be done that night and having kindled a fire and put the billy on to boil i sat down to see what remained out of the wreck the first things to be missed were the candles which had of course been burnt and their loss at once put an end to further investigation till daylight fortunately i had a few matches in my pocket and could manage with care to hold out for a few days as far as they were concerned having had something to eat and some half-burnt tea without sugar to drink i put on kilts i e wrapped the blanket round me and proceeded to dry my clothes by ten o'clock some of the garments were fairly dry so thoroughly tired after the long day i rolled myself in the blanket and in spite of the storm soon forgot this miserable world in a sound sleep however long or hard a day's work has been we cannot sit down and have a spell on returning to camp at night because possibly there is firewood to gather bread to bake and a meal to cook indeed sometimes a meal has to be found with a pea rifle it would be to either of us a luxury beyond belief to have a third man whom we could occasionally leave in camp and to find things ready on our return in the evening the extra work in the evening is far harder than one would imagine even supposing a permanent third member to the party was impossible it would have made our work considerably quicker and less trying had we been given a man who could carry a good load of provisions for two or three days from habitation and then be sent back this would give us a good stock to fall back on and possibly save a long tramp back for food or else a period of starvation it is a trial to one's powers to have to do mental work and heavy packing at the same time in such terribly broken country and for a prolonged season of seven or eight months the authorities however did not consider it necessary not having any idea of what rough work it really was in fact on one occasion when mention was made of the necessity of carrying heavy loads some one asked why do you not employ a spring dray or pack horse imagine a spring dray over fifty foot boulders or along a narrow arete it was often difficult to get the dog over the country the driving rain and high wind whistling under the fly woke me early and at daylight i set to work to build a more satisfactory shelter the creeks and rivers were in flood and uncrossable so there was every prospect of two days delay before i could get away it did not take long to put up two good windbreaks with branches and ferns at each end of the fly and to generally fix up a shelter in which i was as happy as a sandboy in spite of the storm there was now time to examine the effects of the fire which had been very erratic in the first place it is hard to explain why the fly had not been totally destroyed for it was only pitched six inches above the batwing it would seem impossible for the latter to burn from the bottom so completely as it had without setting fire to the fly which is the most inflammable portion of the camp 
owing to the fire always keeping it dry. At each end of the batwing we have two pockets, a large one for field books, etc., and a small one for watch matches and so forth. In the two large ones I had left some photographic plates, notebooks, and a pound of candles. The books and plate boxes were charred a little, and the candles had disappeared. In one of the smaller pockets were a box of 50 P rifle cartridges and two boxes of matches. The cartridges were unhurt, while one box of matches had exploded and the other only melted in a solid mass. On the bedding, my dry clothes and tobacco were in one corner, and within a foot of them the blanket with the half-plate camera and some newspapers on it. Of these, the clothes and tobacco had gone absolutely, leaving a hole burnt to the ground in the scrub where we slept. The other heap was untouched, except the papers on the camera, which were burnt to an ash. Douglas has only once been burnt out, and his experience is the same as that of others, namely, that nothing escapes. My misfortune was, therefore, not as bad as it might have been, and there was good cause to be thankful that some provisions were still left, since my retreat was cut off. Shelter was not of so much importance, because had all the canvas been destroyed, I could have knocked up a mai mai of bark and ferns in an hour. It is impossible to say how the fire originated, unless I had left the candle burning when leaving camp at dawn, in which case, no doubt, one of the wekas had pulled it over while looking for buttons or some such digestible food. The white candle would be an irresistible temptation. After all, it is of little consequence how the thing happened. The fact remained that I had to sit and sigh in idleness for three days. Whilst turning out the contents of one of my pockets, I came across a scrap of an old world, on which was a most appropriate poem entitled, Every Hour Has Its End. This fact is often too true to dispute, but was open to argument under the present circumstances. With nothing to read and very little to smoke, the hours appeared to have at least one hundred minutes. The family of Wekas, which had taken possession of the camp, were very welcome, and I was able to watch their mode of procedure when dissolving partnership for the time being. As already stated, when the male bird thinks he has done his share in the education and bringing up of the family, he dissolves partnership. If in a good locality for food, he drives his mate and young ones away, but if in a poor locality, he departs to happier hunting grounds himself. The parent birds, while rearing their young, hardly eat anything themselves, and grow as poor as a church mouse, everything they find is carried to the youngsters. When a pair has only one chick, it is very ludicrous to see them rushing up to it and jostling one another in their eagerness to give it a piece of bacon or bread, and sometimes asking it to try a piece of jam tin or tempting it with a choice copper cartridge case. The parent finds some such rubbish and rushes off to the overfed fledgling, which is sitting and squeaking under a fern and holds the tempting morsel out in its beak. The old one looks sideways at it, as much as to say, so good, while the youngster, having got it successfully down, sits with ruffled feathers, and looks at the world in general, as if it would say, that old food will be the death of me one of these days. The first intimation I had that the pair at camp were going to dissolve partnership was when I threw out a piece of bread one morning. Pater Familius, instead of passing it to one of the chickens, swallowed it himself, while the rest of the family looked on reproachfully, and seemed to know they must look out for squalls. After the old boy had got all he could, he suddenly turned round and attacked his wife, and then the male youngster, the female chick having wisely disappeared, pro tem. When I saw he was going to drive the family away, and stay at the camp to enjoy all the good things himself, I decided to put a stop to his little game, and gave him a rifle bullet to digest. He made a capital stew, and a sorrowing family thoroughly enjoyed his remains. The next day Mrs. Wecka found the two half-grown chickens rather a large order. In the first place they both tried to shelter themselves under her from the rain, which upset her mentally and physically, and secondly the task of feeding them was too much for her. She therefore proceeded to drive away Master Wecka. That young gentleman, however, was not going to leave his family home without a struggle, and seeing his sister still petted and fed, he used to give her a good peck, when the old hen was not looking, and then run for his life before she caught him. I again interfered in the proceedings, and by dint of some coaxing, persuaded Master Wecka to come on to the bedding in the shelter, where he would eat from my hand. By degrees he gained confidence, and came in without fear, having a good feed, while the old hen remained outside waiting for him. 
on finishing the meal he used to dodge about inside trying to make his escape and the old bird dodged about outside to cut him off i would then throw a piece of bread away into the bush and while she went after it the youngster would slip out and run for dear life rolling his more favoured sister in the mud on the way on the tenth the weather cleared and gave me an opportunity to go down to ryan's hut therefore leaving my friends to settle their own family affairs i rolled up my goods and started down the river meeting douglas and betsy who were coming up to join me however my ankle was still weak and wanted a rest so we went back to the hut to make a new batwing and generally repair damages it required another ten days work to map the glacier so we returned on the sixteenth and took the camp three-quarters of a mile further up the creek than my first camp intending to make some observations as to motion etc and complete the map of the valley fate seemed to be against us on this glacier for out of the thirteen days away from ryan's hut we had only two fine ones and those were the day we came up to camp and the day we returned to ryan's we were however able to make a more thorough exploration of the fox and victoria glaciers below the neve and take a few more bearings on the twenty ninth our stores had come to an end so the weather cleared and the sun shone out beautifully but one or two snowfalls had taken place during the previous week warning us that winter was approaching and that if we intended to reach the head of cook's river and the la perouse glacier we must do so at once and waste no more time over the fox glacier in any case there was little left to be done there while cook river might prove troublesome and there was a danger of further snow preventing our expedition consequently we packed up and carried our loads back to ryan's hut the fox glacier is more attractive than many places much advertised and visited it certainly has not nearly such a grand terminal face as the franz joseph but it is in every other way superior for tourists it is quite as easy of access it has fine surroundings and there are hot springs within a mile of it but the chief attraction to my mind is that any one with ordinary care can go a mile or so along the ice or three miles along the south bank on the old lateral moraines this would enable many who have never seen a glacier to gain some idea of an ice fall at close quarters for though not so fine as that of its neighbour the ice fall of the fox is by no means a poor one an easy and safe expedition could be made to the chancellor ridge from which a grand view of the great peaks and the neve can be gained if the government desired to open up the district a track could be taken up to the glacier and even along its south bank at a small cost and a hut placed on the chancellor to go even a short distance on to the franz joseph glacier with safety would require an expert at ice work there are many interesting features on the fox glacier which are more marked than on other ice streams in new zealand on no other glacier in the southern alps is the veined structure of the ice so apparent in fact i have never seen such a fine example of this anywhere the ice is laminated to such an extent just above the cone rock that it resembles a ploughed field and the furrows being from six inches to a foot in depth and the same distance apart in places are very troublesome to walk over the lamination does not run in one direction and though most of the lines are longitudinal they sometimes curve gracefully toward the margin of the ice wherever a crevasse occurs the effect is beautiful and the lines can be seen descending perpendicularly as far as there is light to see another peculiarity on the fox is the number of moulins or funnels in the ice abreast of and above the cone rock they are most noticeable and though not as fine as many i have seen elsewhere they are very good specimens from six to ten feet across at the top and two or three feet a little lower down for roche moutonnet this valley does not equal the franz joseph but has a splendid example of a great isolated rock in the cone the northern bank too from the terminal face to the ice fall presents a good instance of steep faces of rock abraded by glacier action lateral moraines of various ages can be examined on the south side of the valley and large erratic blocks found on the top of the cone rock the individual points of interest may be surpassed with the exception of the first mention in other localities but nowhere else in new zealand can they be seen to such perfection collected in one valley easy to reach and easy to inspect and examine owing to the smooth surface of the glacier in addition to this there is the fact of still more peculiar interest namely a glacier in 
approximate latitude forty three degrees twenty nine minutes thirty seconds south descending over nine miles to six hundred and seventy feet above sea level within ten miles of the beach this can also be said of the franz joseph but it does not at the same time possess all the other interesting features mentioned above nor is it so easy to travel on the very easy travelling and unbroken surface of the fox glacier shows i imagine that the ice is of greater depth than that of the franz joseph it may be that this smoothness is due to the bed of the valley having fewer obstructions that there are several rocky obstacles under the ice of the latter cannot i think be doubted and accounts for the heaving appearance which the ice of that glacier has i am not aware that the old saying still waters run deep can be applied to a glacier but it appears to me that the fox glacier must be of considerable depth or it would not flow down as steeply as it does without having a rougher and more broken surface at the terminal face the ice pushes its way under the level of the river bed in several places holes in the gravel caused by subsidence due to the melting ice can be seen towards the end of the summer the water too does not come out in an ordinary manner but bubbles up like a great spring to a height of three feet in ordinary weather and five or six feet during rain this shows that the streams which flow under the ice are considerably below the river bed level when they reach the terminal face and on being released from the ice rush up to the surface with great force in july eighteen ninety four douglas and mr wilson paid a brief visit to the glacier and the former noticed a very marked change in the ice as will be seen in a later chapter we anticipate a decided winter advance in the franz joseph glacier and were disappointed to find that a retreat only was evident the fact of these two glaciers descending to such a low altitude would lead one to expect a greater proportional winter motion than is to be found on higher glaciers for the melting would be less by a great deal than in the summer and yet the rapid descent and frequent rain would cause a movement greater in comparison to the melting than we should find in the hotter months this was fully borne out in the case of the fox glacier for douglas found some of my flags which had been as usual visible from each other invisible from points where originally they could be seen owing to the ice having banked up considerably also on two rocky points or capes on the north side the ice had completely covered a large portion of rock visible in the summer i do not know why this advance or increase was visible on the fox glacier while on its neighbour a general decrease was found it may be and probably is due to the different aspect of the two valleys this one faces slightly north of west and therefore loses the winter sun for many hours in the day on its lower portion while the franz joseph faces due north and receives the whole heat of the day again this glacier has the steep hillsides on the sunny side while the other has them on the opposite side when reliable observations as to the motion of the ice are taken we shall probably find a much higher rate of flow on the franz joseph than on the fox glacier an unnamed peak generally confused with hedinger from the west coast and not visible except from high points on the eastern ranges stands at the head of the fox and is the most prominent summit from the terminal face this i have seen from several different points and always held that it is distinct from hedinger when fitzgerald made his ascent of the latter he left a large cairn on the summit and he and i distinctly saw this from the fritz glacier when we were there during the next season i had explained my contention to him before we started and we therefore made a point of deciding the question since hedinger was first named from the tasman and the name has been put on the wrong peak by the west coast department it should be retained on the summit seen from the eastern side i have generally called this unnamed peak the horn for it is a distinct horn from the west coast de la Beche, and darwin hedinger proper does not show as a peak at all from the fox glacier though one of the finest as seen from the tasman the first impression i received on looking at the surroundings of the fox neve was that peaks rising from it would be most troublesome to climb from this side but the fog cut off my view so soon that the mistake was excusable since then however a second visit has shown that so far from being more difficult they would seem to be easier on this side than from the tasman from the chancellor ridge the horn glacier peak and hedinger are all accessible as also are the chief peaks of the bismarck range good passes may be found between mount tasman and mount host also between the latter and hedinger in fact so many expeditions of interest are to be made from here 
that I hope it will not be many years before we see a good hut placed on the Chancellor. End of chapter 8